Good morning, students, staff, faculty, administration, and members of the community to the keynote address for the 17th annual Martin Luther King commemoration. The fact that we are here today indicates that we celebrate the legacy and the struggles and the successes of Dr. King in the areas of racial, social, and economic justice, sure. But the fact that we are here today also indicates that there is much more to be done. And these yearly commemorations remind us that we must rededicate ourselves to continuing the struggle by reimagining the dream right now in the context of what confronts us in the 21st century. So the theme this year is reimagining the dream. How liberating that idea is. It frees us to rework, to reconfigure the words of King and others and apply them to the challenges of today. Immigration, sexual orientation, discrimination of the disabled, gender and racial discrimination, and a discussion of the meaning and definition of citizenship itself in the, within the context of the 14th Amendment. So we must put our shoulders to the wheel every day. As I introduce Ambassador Young, I am reminded of the many other voices who precede him here at the university in years past, like Clay Carson, the director of the Martin Luther King Papers Project, Elizabeth Eckford, a member of the Little Rock Nine who integrated Central High School in 1957. Yolanda King, the eldest daughter of Martin and Coretta Scott King. Morris Dees, the co-founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center. And just last year, Linda Brown and Cheryl Brown, who were at the center of the Brown versus Board of Education case uh, before the United States Supreme Court in 1954. Ambassador Young was born in New Orleans in 1932. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree from Howard University in 1951 and a Bachelor of Divinity degree from the Hartford Seminary in 1955. He worked in many capacities in the ministry through the 50s and the 60s with Dr. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference on various voting rights campaigns and the effort to effect passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of one year later. In fact, it was as an aide to Dr. King that Mr. Young was in Memphis on April the 4th, 1968 to support the sanitation workers strike when King was shot and killed at the Lorraine Motel. Mr. Young served in the United States Congress representing Georgia's 5th District from 1973 to 1977, a strong supporter of Jimmy Carter's presidential bid. Mr. Young was appointed U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations from 1977 to 1979. He then returned to Atlanta where he served that city as mayor from 1982 to 1990. His leadership and commitment to public policy and community development have continued to this day. For example, as leader of the effort to bring the Olympic Games to Atlanta in 1996, as co-chair of the consulting firm Good Works International, and of course as the architect of the Andrew Young Foundation. Ambassador Young is the author of a Way Out of No Way, The Spiritual Journey of Andrew Young, An Easy Burden, The Civil Rights Movement and the Transformation of America, and recently, Walk in My Shoes, Conversations Between the Civil Rights Legend and His Godson on the Journey Forward. And twice he has been a guest on the Stephen Colbert Show and survived. And maybe that is his greatest accomplishment. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce to you Ambassador Andrew Young. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. I was asking, what time do you want me to quit? <laughs> because given an opportunity like this and an audience like this, I could almost go on all morning. Because I've been at this a long, long time. We're talking about the journey ahead. But um, I wanted to go back to the journey that I've led very briefly. I was a pastor in uh, South Georgia in 1956. And uh, Martin Luther King had the first march on Washington, uh, a march for voting rights. And we were talking about give us the ballot. Uh, and I came back and we had a voter registration drive and a, a big Klan rally uh, tried to stop it. Uh, but we were able to get through that nonviolently. A little later on, I went to work with Martin Luther King and um, was with him uh, in Birmingham when after desegregating Birmingham, a group of young people decided that they wanted to march on Washington. Now we were strongly influenced by the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi. And Gandhi had this salt march to the sea uh, to inform the British Empire of uh, the fact that they were struggling for their total independence uh, without violence. Um, some of our young people saw a march on Washington like Gandhi's salt march to the sea. Uh, they wanted to get out on Highway 11 uh, and start walking. Uh, and uh, we said, well, how are you going to feed yourself? They said, people along the way will feed us. Gandhi and India were poorer than the United States. Uh, people will not let us go hungry. Well, it didn't really sit right with a lot of the leadership, so we ended up organizing the March on Washington, uh, and we uh, ended up with uh, a massive rally. And Martin Luther King made his famous I Have a Dream speech. Now, the speech is known as the I Have a Dream speech, but that was never in the speech. The speech that Martin Luther King wrote, which was supposed to be nine minutes, um, was really about economic justice. And it said that America had presented the Negro with a bad check, and that when everybody else went to the bank of justice, uh, their checks were cashed. When the Negro went to the bank of justice, the check came back March marked insufficient funds. And the talk was about poverty and the fact that we had not yet received the full benefits of health, education, and welfare from a government that we helped to develop, even as slaves. But we only remember the dream part. Uh, but that dream part also came out of a slogan that was adopted right after the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955, in 57, um, when the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was formed. It was to redeem the soul of America from the triple evils of racism, war, and poverty. Now, most of us think about racism, uh, but in the late 60s, we became equally involved in the questions of the legitimacy of America going to war. Right now, nobody talks about it. But Korea would have been my war. If I had gone to the Army as a second lieutenant from ROTC, when I graduated from Howard University, I would have been sent straight to Korea. I didn't go because uh, I got discharged. Uh, I couldn't hold a gun right. I had broken my hand, and my, hand, my arm was set in a segregated hospital in Louisiana uh, when I was four years old. Uh, 
And I was holding the gun like this. And I could shoot. I, I was hitting the target. I could shoot a shotgun even like that. But the sergeant said, no, you can't hold Uncle Sam's rifle that way. So he gave me a medical discharge, uh, which probably saved my life. But later on, I realized and learned that um, the war in Korea might not have been necessary, that uh, the Chinese only wanted reassurance that America was not going to invade China through Korea. And a simple phone call from the United States government, and there were attempts made to call President Roosevelt and later President Truman. And when there was no assurance given, a million Chinese launched into Korea, and there was a massacre of American troops. This is just an aside, but uh, because he's being so humiliated and defamed, uh, Congressman Charlie Rangel uh, was an 18-year-old volunteer in Korea at the time, in the frozen snow when the Chinese came. And a helicopter came in and picked up the officers and took them out and left him there in the snow. <laughs> Uh, and yet, in spite of that kind of betrayal, time and time again, he con continued to work and to represent a dis district and uh, not defending anything that he did that was wrong, but just reminding us that here was one of our teenage heroes who withstood a war in Korea that didn't need to be. If you look back on the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, the resolution that Lyndon Johnson used to start the war in Vietnam, no American ship was ever fired on. It was simply an American ship that was in the Gulf of Tonkin that uh, was lost in the fog. And when the fog lifted, they were surrounded by Vietnamese fishing boats none of which had any guns, and no shots were fired at any American vessel. And yet that was used to launch the war in Vietnam, in which 50,000 Americans and maybe 300,000 or more Vietnamese were killed. But for me, that's progress. It's progress because in the war of the greatest generation, the Second World War, 60 million or more people were killed. And to adopt a philosophy of containment that led us from huge world wars into smaller interventions, I've got to see his progress. So you go from 60 million in Korea to 50 million, I mean 50,000 in Korea to 60 million in World War II, 60,000 in Korea, 50,000 in Vietnam, uh, you know, less than 10,000 in Iraq doesn't look too bad. And even though it's been struggling for nine years, Afghanistan, is as much a political struggle as it is a military battle. Now maybe for you that's not progress, but from where I said America is learning to live in a world where there is enormous conflict potential, where there is rampant terrorism, and been very restrained and political and economic as well as military, in trying to deal with those issues. And don't forget that during the Carter administration, an administration that was castigated for being weak because we didn't kill anybody and we didn't get anybody killed. But we negotiated treaties with Panama. The only peace that Israel has is the peace 
that President Carter negotiated with the Egyptians. And so since 1978, no Egyptian has killed any Israeli, and no Israeli has killed any Egyptian. It was the beginning of the uh, demilitarization of the Soviet Union, and the first arms limitation treaty was signed under Jimmy Carter. And it has continued to lower and de-escalate the conflict with the Russians ever since. And we could go on and on about the things that were positive that happened. All of Southern Africa uh, was changed. And when I went to South Africa in 1974 um, with Arthur Ashe to play tennis, I was carrying his bags. Uh, and we did it because we thought that it was important we knew the role that sports heroes had played in the United States. And we said, for a young black man to get out in, on the tennis court, which is basically back then a white man's sport, and hold his own is in itself a statement of racial equality. Uh, and we encouraged Arthur to go, and we wouldn't play before a, desegregated, a segregated audience and so we were integrated into the government box. So for an entire week, I ended up talking with all of the uh, hardliners who had Nelson Mandela and most of my friends in jail. But we were able to reason and to help them to see. The first question they asked me was, how long do you think it'll be before we have a bloodbath? I said, what do you mean? He said, some kind of uprising by the black community. And I said, you probably won't have one. They said, why not? I said, because you have leaders like Nelson Mandela and like Desmond Tutu, who essentially are in, in the tradition of Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi. And Gandhi actually started his nonviolent movement in South Africa in about 1912 as the African National Congress was being formed. And so they didn't believe me. But uh, with the Carter administration, we worked with the French and the Germans, the British, uh, and the Canadians, uh, and created a partnership with Nigeria, Tanzania, Zambia, uh, Mozambique, and Angola. And we found a way to change all of Southern Africa with a limited amount of violence. In fact, I was sent to Africa, oh, at least a dozen times on a dozen different occasions, maybe more than that. Uh, but I never took a gun, and I never had anybody with me who had a gun. Uh, and we found a way to reason together in spite of the enormous differences. And I found, you know, that the hardliners in South Africa were not much different from the hardliners in Alabama, uh, or Louisiana where I was born, or Georgia where I was living. And we found that nonviolence could work worldwide. And it has been working. And so I would say that we are making enormous progress in terms of racism and war. There's enormously less overt racism now than there has ever been in the United States of America. The election of Barack Obama proves that at least a simple majority of Americans are willing to judge a man by the content of his character rather than the color of his skin. And so that election proved something about racism. And I think what I've talked about gives us some indication of where we've come in regard to war. But where we have made less progress, maybe even no progress, is in the question of poverty. That the gap between the rich and the poor is wider now than it was at the time of Martin Luther King's life that shortly before I went to work with Martin Luther King, I was living in New York, and uh, my wife was getting a master's in education at Queens College. 
The tuition at Queens College for her master's degree was $16 a semester. She got a master's degree for $32. There was a realization back in the 50s that an educated population would generate more wealth, pay more taxes, and be a positive contribution to the development of society. So there was a government responsibility for seeing to it that everybody who has the mental capacity to be educated will be able to be educated to the maximum because that was in the best interest of our nation. I see outside you've got a sign, no more tuition hikes. Uh, that would not have been true necessary in the 50s because there was still a commitment to educating all of the bright minds of the United States of America. And there was also a commitment to public education that we don't seem to have anymore. And public education from kindergarten and preschool right on through graduate school is really the ultimate strength of the American dream. And so we find ourselves somewhat slipping back on that cause and people wanting to withdraw government support from education. I performed the wedding of two young people in my church um, about three years ago. Uh, and uh, I saw them uh, last year and I said, isn't it time you all started having some babies? Now, she has a Harvard Law degree, and he has an MBA from uh, Syracuse and a degree from Brown, uh, and uh, they said, we can't afford to have children. I said, come on. I mean, <laughs> you all are amongst the best educated people we got. You've got great jobs. They said, yes, but we have... Between us, we have about $350,000 left in student debt. There's something wrong in America when the brightest and the best of our society cannot have children. And if you can't have children, you sure can't start a business. You're totally crippled by student debt. And that's part of the problem of the alleviation of poverty that is part of our looking at the journey ahead. But it's even more complicated than that, it seems, because now people are saying one thing and meaning another. They're talking about Obamacare, and I don't know what that is. What I do know is that when my baby, my first child, was born in Thomasville, Georgia, as my first pastorate, I was making $190 a month. And I didn't know how I was going to pay for this baby. But I went to the hospital, and they said, well, you have to put down a $50 deposit, which I did. And I sweated and said, now, where is the rest going to come from? Because I had no health insurance. But um, when I went back two and a half days later to get my wife and baby out, I asked, now, how much do I owe and how long can I take to pay it? They said, oh, you don't owe anything. In fact, you have an $18 refund. My first child cost $32. In Thomasville, Georgia, in a hospital that was funded under something called the Hill-Burton Act. Now, Lister Hill of Alabama, the senator from Alabama, who was the founder of that act, nobody could consider a liberal in any sense of the word, but he was concerned about the needs of poor people to have good medical care in the rural south. So the Hill-Burton hospitals really were funded by the government in all of the small towns across America, and they made health care available for poor preachers and other poor people. But everybody in America had a right to health care. And this was in 1955. And now 
the same year that Obama passed this notorious Obamacare, uh, my son had his first child. And he had insurance through his business, and his wife had insurance through her business. And they married, and after they'd been married a while, they realized they were paying two health insurances. They didn't even think about it. They just canceled hers. He's the big macho man. They put it on, put my wife on my health care. Except that a month or two later, when she went to the doctor and discovered she was pregnant, neither health care, neither health insurance would cover her pregnancy. Because pregnancy was a pre-existing condition. And my grandbaby, sweet and wonderful as she is, cost him almost $10,000. Now, because they both had good jobs and businesses, they were able to struggle and pay it. But as much as I love my grandbaby, um, I don't think she's $9,500 better than my, my own daughter. <laughs> I mean, she's going to have to earn a lot uh, and make a wonderful contribution, which inevitably she will. But there's something wrong with that. Now, under so-called Obamacare, she would not be denied insurance because pregnancy was a pre-existing condition. I lost my first wife of 40 years to cancer. But when I left City Hall in Atlanta in 1990, uh, since I hadn't been mayor for more than eight years, and in fact, you have to have 14 years to qualify to keep pension, I got no pension from Congress, no pension from the UN, no pension from SCLC. I didn't hardly even get a salary there. Uh, but for about two years between 1990 and 1991, I had no health insurance. In 1992, toward the end of 1992, I discovered that my wife had uh, incurable, they said, cancer. If I had not been able to be employed, if I had stayed off from work another three or four months, I wouldn't have had health insurance to make it possible for her to struggle against cancer for three and a half years. That wouldn't happen under so-called Obamacare. I would have been able to find a way to have insurance and cancer would not have been a pre-existing condition if it had been discovered while I was uh, still relatively unemployed. Uh, so these are the issues. These are the issues for the journey ahead. And they're mostly economic and they mostly have to do with poverty. Now forgive me, any economics majors in the room? One or two. We need a few dozen. We need about a hundred from a school like this. Because the problems that we're facing now related to poverty are no longer what you'd call microeconomic problems, they are macroeconomic problems. And if you don't know what that means, take you some economics and find out because it's going to determine your life for the rest of your time on this earth. I was in the banking committee in 1973 never having had a course in economics either. I was a biology major. Uh, but mass transit was under banking, and banking was part of urban affairs, and so a congressman from Atlanta trying to build an airport and a mass transit system uh, got put on the banking committee. In the first meeting of the International Finance Committee, Arthur Burns, who was the head of the Federal Reserve, George Schultz, a brilliant Secretary of Treasury and later Secretary of State, and Paul Volcker, who is still one of the President's advisors. I don't think they're listening to him. Uh, they came to uh, 
say that it was time for the Bretton Woods agreements to be ended. I leaned over to Ed Koch, who was next to me. I said, what are the Bretton Woods agreements? He leaned over and asked the next congressman. Uh, it seemed like nobody knew. So I asked one of the aides to check what the Bretton Woods, and they said, this was the agreement that was made in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire in 1944. And it was all of the nations of the world coming together and deciding that to recover from the Second World War, a stable global economy was an absolute necessity. So they tied everybody's currency to the dollar, and the dollar was tied to gold. And from 1944 to about 1974, when, this, when we had repealed this, there was a stable global economy where just about every economy grew between 5 and 10%. Uh, the A Asian economies, the European economies that had been devastated by war, the emerging colonies in uh, the Latin America and Africa were all growing at a stable rate. And in that stability from 1974 to, I mean, from 1944 to 1974, we had a relatively stable economy in this country. That was the period when we had the lowest unemployment. That was the period when we were able to educate people for $30 a year for a master's degree. That was the time when uh, I could have a baby for less than $50. And suddenly, they ended that agreement. And nobody much asked any questions. I was the youngest and probably the dumbest. And I've never been shy about being the dumbest in the room. The one who asks the dumb question, asks the dumb questions. Um, usually gets the admiration of everybody else who wanted to ask it and didn't have the nerve. So I sort of made a career in college about asking dumb questions. And so when I got to Congress, it was the same. I said, excuse me, sir, but um, if you don't tie the dollar to something, aren't people going to play politics with our currency? And Arthur Burns took a puff on his pipe, so you know how long ago that was. And he said, young man, you'll soon learn that the dollar does not need you to defend it. That's like, shut up, colored boy. <laughs> but he didn't mean it that way. Later on, 25 years later, Paul Volcker wrote a book where he admitted that Arthur Burns, George Schultz, and him had not even discussed this with each other. They had received orders from the White House and I remember that at the time we ended those Bretton Woods agreements, oil was $2.50 to $3 a barrel. And now, what is it, $80, $90 a barrel? It seemed like we went off the gold standard onto the oil standard. The gold standard was something we had agreed on. Now, we might have adjusted it, we might have modified it, but. It was really more serious than that. It was a change from the economics of John Maynard Keynes, who wrote a huge book about how to reconstruct the world after the Second World War. And in 1973, Milton Friedman of the University of Chicago had advocated a global economy with no rules, no regulations, no limits. Now, if you read a little of Keynes, and I haven't read but a little, you get a sense that he is a man who believes in the moral order of the universe, if not God. When you read a little, and I've read even less of Friedman, but what I've read about him, you have the impression that there is no God. Profit is God. And money has its own value system. And so it's perfectly legitimate 
for people in the investment banking industry to sell you a house, then take the mortgage and sell it to somebody else, and then bet that you don't pay it. And they get money if you don't pay your mortgage. Now, they've given you a $750,000 mortgage when you don't make but you know, $10,000, $15,000 a year as a couple. So there's no way you can possibly pay that mortgage, but they would give it to you. And they'd make money giving it to you, and then they'd make money betting that you couldn't pay it. Now, that's just not right. I don't care whose economics you believe in. Martin Luther King also said, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. That economics that we are now practicing now in our treasury and in our, our banking system doesn't believe that there's a moral arc of the universe. It believes that might is right. They believe in the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. And that has not proven to be successful in our history. And so the problem of poverty is not just a problem of educating individuals, of giving opportunities for work. It basically is a macroeconomic problem, which means we're going to have to go back to something like Bretton Woods. We're going to have to have some agreement with the Chinese because we owe them more money than we can pay back. And the problem is, if we try to cut back on our budget and in order to cut back the debt and pay off the Chinese, we don't buy enough Chinese goods, and then the Chinese economy begins to fall apart. And what Martin Luther King said was, we are inextricably bound in a single garment of destiny. And never has that been more true than it is today. That when Mexico was on the verge of collapse, we had to bail them out. When there was an Asian crisis, we had to bail them out. We have bailed out so many people in my lifetime. In fact, I read just a few months ago, less than three months ago, that Germany is just now paying off the debt that we loaned them in the wake of World War II. And so some of the economics that we're thinking and talking now, acting as though we are a single nation still running the world, just doesn't make sense. But I, I was critical of the Obama administration, not because I don't like him. He's a brilliant man. He's a wonderful man. He's done more than I ever thought he could, but all of his advisors came from the University of Chicago and Harvard. <laughs> and they all believed in that Friedman mess. And they were the ones that did away, not under Obama, but back under Clinton. They did away with the uh, Glass-Steagall Act, which allowed the banks to do some of these heinous things. They did away with Regulation Q, which separated savings and loans from commercial banks. Now, that didn't seem to be important, and nobody likes regulations, but that was the regulations that kept community banks, savings and loans, dealing only in housing. As soon as we ended that regulation, they got into things like ski resorts, which is good for this area, uh, but they also did gambling casinos, and they did all kinds of things they didn't know anything about. And all of the savings and loans went bankrupt. And with no savings and loans working in individual housing loans, the commercial banks, who didn't know anything about housing, got into housing, and they went into so much trouble that we had to bail them out. It seems as though some kind of guidelines Something is necessary. We, we have to think through this economic predicament because we can't fail because if we fail, China fails. If China fails, India fails. If, 
You have war between India and China, and both of them have atomic bombs. Uh, the world is gone. And so we find ourselves with a very dangerous journey ahead. But a journey that can be solved without violence. A journey that can look at people and judge them not by the color of their skin or their language or their heritage, but by the content of their character. When the Chinese first came back into the United Nations, uh, I uh, was ambassador to the United Nations, and nobody knew anything about China. In fact, these sophisticated diplomats got to talking with the Chinese about Chinese food and the best Chinese restaurants in New York because they didn't know what else to talk about. And finally, in disgust, the Chinese ambassador came over to my wife and said, where you find good Georgia food? And she said, only at my house. When are you coming to dinner? I said, but baby, our house is the 42nd floor of the Waldorf. There ain't no Georgia food in the Waldorf. She said, don't worry about it, my mama's coming up. <laughs> and so her mother drove up uh, with a station wagon filled with slowly smoked ribs, uh, with corn on the cob, with black eyed peas, with the makings of cornbread, and um, all the other things that go into a good Georgia meal. And she went down in the Waldorf kitchen. Well, she said, there are 20 stoves here. I don't need but one. Give me one in the corner and get out of my way. And she went down there and spent her day making cornbread and frying chicken and warming those ribs. And they laid them out on silver trays. And the entire Chinese delegation came to dinner. As the last minute, I said, oh, they tell me that the Chinese drink a lot. What should we serve? And I called a friend of mine, and he said, I said, what is that that you serve at your Kentucky Derby parties? He said, oh, mint juleps. I said, well, how do you make that? He said, the Waldorf knows. Just tell them you want to serve mint juleps. So when the Chinese delegation came, there were all the waiters from the Waldorf with these big silver trays and silver cups of mint juleps. Well, now you don't know what that is since you're not Southern. But a mint julep is nothing but pure bourbon poured on crushed ice with a little lemon and mint and also a little sweetening syrup to make you think you're drinking Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> well, after a couple of men juleps and sitting down to that southern dinner, we had no more problems with the Chinese. <laughs> I had seen a picture of Adlai Stevenson sitting on the floor uh, in that same living room. So I got down on the floor, and immediately the Chinese foreign minister got down there with me. And we sat around from 9 o'clock till almost 1 o'clock in the morning talking about their experiences in schools in the United States of America. I didn't know anything about China, but every member of the Chinese delegation had studied at some school in America. And they knew everything there was to know. They knew more about us than I knew. And I began to realize that these are people we have to work with. Now, we had an upheaval because of black and white problems in the South and in the nation. When I visited China, they talked in terms of 104 different national minorities. That is, there are 104 million people who are sort of like Tibet. They really are considered Chinese by the Chinese government, but they don't want to be. So the stability and security of China, as the stability and security of India, all in some way depend on their being able to solve these problems without violence. If China erupts into violence, it will reverberate all through here. Because all of your computers are made in China. All of your cell phones probably are made in China. Uh, and if there's a war, it disrupts the global supply chain. And so we can't afford to have war anymore. We can only afford, as Martin Luther King promised, 
that we must learn to live together as brothers and sisters, or we will perish together as fools. And so the journey ahead is a journey about poverty, but not just American poverty. If we're going to solve the problems between China and America and Europe, Africa is going to be increasingly important because Africa may be the richest continent on the face of the earth. They can use everything we can make, they can buy it, and they can pay for it. The only problem is all their resources are in the ground. And so if this world is going to make sense, Chinese, Americans, Europeans, Latin Americans are all going to have to find some way to live and work together as brothers, or we will perish together as fools. Now, I'm optimistic enough. I believe enough in the American people that every time we have been at one of these critical notions in our society, we have produced leadership to rise to the occasion. But that leadership is not just our president. That leadership has to be in the Congress. That leadership has to be in the boards of education. That leadership has to be in the businesses that we start and maintain. That vision of one nation under God, indivisible, has to be expanded for us to realize that it's one world under God. And somehow, even if we don't make it indivisible, We've got to learn to get along with them if we're going to make it ourselves. And so I don't know about you, but I've been in this struggle a long time, but there's a, a modern Negro spiritual which says, Lord, I don't feel no ways tired. We've come too far from where you brought us from. And nobody told us that the way would be easy, but I don't believe that he brought us this far to leave us. Thank you very much. I think I just heard that somehow the journey ahead uh, requires uh, mint juleps on the menu there. <laughs> and, and some doctorates in economics. And some doctorates in economics. Ambassador Young has agreed to take um, a couple of questions, and we have some mobile mics that are in the aisles. So if you have a question, please uh, hold your hand up and stand up. Sir? Hi. Hi, my name is Robert. Um, wonderful speech, and it's addicting to hear your optimism and your outlook towards the world in the future. I think one of the biggest issues that's happening now, especially in the political arena here in the United States, it's towards immigration. And there's a lot of fire on both sides of, of the aisle, I guess you could say. Can you probably um, make some connections between the 60s civil rights movements and what's partaking now in immigration debates. I'll be glad to. And just before he died, Martin Luther King invited Cesar Chavez to Atlanta along with other poor people's organizations to launch the Poor People's Campaign. And one of the main issues that we were working on was immigration. Now, I have a visionary approach to immigration. So I've always felt that we needed a new Panama Canal and if we'd, it would pay for itself because it would mean that the super tankers wouldn't have to go all around the, the horn of southern Africa or southern South America. Uh, they could come right through a widened canal. Uh, a sea level Panama Canal through Panama or Nicaragua or somewhere in there would probably be a $20 billion proposition. That would pay for itself. If you created that many jobs, 
in Central America, you wouldn't have an immigration problem here. The immigration is about jobs. Now, I think as we begin to develop major projects in Central America, uh, that's going to alleviate some of the conditions. Uh, we have not, we've not been able to get a handle on these drug wars. And so the other thing that's driving people here is the lack of security. But let me say my experience with people who have come here as immigrants, whether they be Latin American or African or Asian, is that they come here for two generations. Now let me give you a little fact that uh, you probably have never heard of, and I hadn't heard it till recently. There were four million Africans who came here in the slave trade in the 16th, 17th centuries. Do you know that five million Africans have come to the United States voluntarily since 1970? And they are the second most educated group of immigrants coming to the United States. They came with education and with money. And what's happening now is the same thing is happening in Africa that happened a, genera a generation ago in India. I went to visit Mrs. Gandhi with uh, Mrs. Coretta King shortly after Dr. King was assassinated. And Mrs. Gandhi said, I tell our boys and girls to go to America, to go to England, make as much money as they can and learn as much as they can and hurry back to Mother India. Well, that's what we see happening in India. That's what we see happening in China. That's what we see happening in Africa. Uh, when I was on the board of Delta Airlines, I was trying to get them to fly to Africa and they couldn't see the market. Now, the most profitable flights in the entire Delta system, there are 11 flights a day to Africa. What these are are the third generation of the immigrants who came here with education and money, their grandchildren are wanting to go back to their motherland to develop businesses, to build their retirement homes for their parents. And um, immigration has helped us create a global economy. When I was first left the Olympics, uh, I was asked by Nike to go do a study of their plants in China and Vietnam and in Indonesia. And I did it knowing it was controversial, but I wanted to see for myself what these plants were like. Well, almost every one of these plants uh, was managed by somebody educated in the United States, in China. And so there were no, not many problems in China with the Nike plants. The problems were in Indonesia and in Vietnam, where the plants were being run by Koreans and there's a culture clash between Koreans and Vietnamese that didn't exist between Koreans and, and Americans, uh, or that didn't exist between Vietnamese and Americans. And so I think that uh, we're not going to be able to stop immigration. And I think we can turn in immigration into a vehicle of global peace and economic development. Uh, that um, there was a young lady who came to me when I was mayor and she was a volunteer from a little college in Indiana, uh, came down for the Martin Luther King celebration and she was about to graduate and she said, I would like to come here and go to school, and uh, I'd like to go to law school, but I, I need a job. Well, we didn't have anybody speaking Spanish in our contract compliance, so I said, well, if you can come back and, uh, and help us in contract compliance, we got a job for you. Well, she not only ran contract compliance uh, for the eight years I was mayor, but she got a law degree and finished in the top three in her class at Georgia State Law School. She left us and went out to California for Mexican-American Legal Defense Fund. 
Uh, and um, in the course of this, she brought her family to Atlanta to meet me, and all of them had come here illegally. But they were all upstanding citizens, committed to education, to American values, and anxious to contribute uh, to the American way of life insofar as, well, I should say the Judeo-Christian way of life from Mexico. Uh, but the same thing would probably true, be true of people coming here who are Muslim, or Hindus, or Buddhist. There's something contagious about our concept of democracy that we might not agree with every part of it, but anybody who has lived anywhere else will more than likely say that uh, as messy as our democracy can be, it's probably better than anything else they know in the world. Uh, my uh, question is this. Uh, what do you, you see as p a potential, um, well, John F. Kennedy in 1963 said, you know, we want to put a man on the moon. I'm kind of thinking maybe in our country we need a collective mission that might bring people together, you know, both political parties, you know, just people in America in general. What well, do you see as a potential uh, mission that might do that? Because I think that might be good for our country. To I, have I think mission. the vision that I have that's absolutely necessary is the definition and, and creation of a truly just global economy. And the reason I said some of you ought to be majoring in economics is that I don't think that people who are born with trust funds and who never had a job, never owned a business, will be able to conceive of an economy that will help people like us. And so I think uh, Georgia State University named its public policy school the Andrew Young School. And one of the things I've been trying, it's very much like this. We've got about 32,000 students that are all basically working poor. They're working and going to school and getting degrees and, and uh, they've come up from families where they're the first generation of, to get a college education. And that's where the brilliance of America is. America has always begun, been, been able to produce uh, strength from the bottom up. It very seldom comes from the top down only. Now I'm not, I'm not anti-rich, uh, but I'm just, I just believe that democracy means that all men are endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights, and women, and children, and that America that is inclusive is an America that's most likely to be able to give leadership to the world. Um, well, let's see, I'm, I wanted to ask a question kind of framed around the recent events with the, the um, shooting, the Arizona shooting, and it's kind of made the issue of um, nonviolent action and how we talk about nonviolent action changed a little bit. Have you thought about that? I'm, I would I've love to hear thought about it a lot, and I'm more and more convinced that it's only nonviolent action. I see that a number of congressmen are gonna start carrying guns, I understand. Well, I can't conceive of uh, being a member of Congress, coming to a meeting like this, and keeping my, my, my holster free uh, so that I can shoot somebody that might stand up. I mean, it, that's cowboy movies. That's not 20th century. 
But I think that so many of Americans are caught up in a cowboy movie syndrome uh, that, um, that violence is an outcome of the hostility. I mean, for instance, when you demagogue, and it's demagoguery to call health care Obamacare. It was demagoguery to call the Bush tax cuts Bush tax cuts. We've got to talk about the issues. What does it mean? If we talk about the substance rather than the labels, one of the things that we did with some success uh, in the civil rights movement was we never personalized our enemies. In fact, one of the stories I like to tell is that in Boston, there was a lady by the name of Louise Day Hicks who made a name for herself uh, fighting busing. And finally, there were some Quakers up there in Boston, and they said, look, we're making a mistake demonizing this lady. Let's just don't call her name, and let's talk about the school situation. When they didn't call her name, she lost the next election. They were making her the problem. Well, not, well, she was not the problem. It was how do we work out a means of getting our schools desegregated? And um, so I think we've got to turn the volume down on the rhetoric. Uh, and um, I don't think I talked against anybody. I mean, I mentioned uh, Arthur Burns and George Schultz and Paul Volcker, but these are men that I have known and respected and learned uh, one heck of a lot from. It's just that on that Bretton Woods vote, it occurred about two weeks before Watergate broke, and we never went back to discuss it. And so we've had a sea change in the economy of the United States and the world, and nobody knew it was going on. That's not the way a democracy it can work. And so the only reason I referred to them, and it was negative, I mean, I think there's some positive things. Um, there would be people who would say that uh, it created a sudden spurt of economic growth uh, to have done this. It might be the right thing to do, but it's never the right thing to make a big, big change in the lifestyle or the values of a society without a thorough discussion in a democracy. Can I say just a minute that this book was a result of a kid coming to argue with me in second grade. I was the mayor, and this second grader calls me up and says, I'd like to have an interview with the mayor. Uh, and I said, okay, what do you want to talk about? And he said, I said, no, that's all right. You want to come down here? And he came down, um, and he did a real interview, and we became friends. And... Uh, I followed his education through high school. I wrote recommendations to him to college, and he's gotten a degree at Dartmouth and London School of Economics, and now he's a big shot banker with uh, J.P. Morgan. Well, they don't necessarily agree with some of the things that I'm saying, so we argue all the time over the phone. About two years ago, he said, uh, he ran into a historian, uh, Doug Brinkley, down in Louisiana, who said, you know, you ought to ask uh, Andy Young to let you tape those conversations. Uh, you might have the benefit of a book. And so I said, what the heck, I'm not running for anything. Uh, <laughs> I don't care what people think about what I say. Uh, and, um, and so that's the way this book came about. But it's his questions, not my, my vision. Though his questions led me to something of my vision. Join me once again in thanking Ambassador Young. <laughs>